Hello, and welcome to Coffee and Storytime with Lyman. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I thought it was time for me to get back onto the camera and tell another story and have a cup of coffee with you. What I want to talk about today is something that happened to me many was, years ago on October 11th, 2002. I am a retired military policeman of the United States Army, an MP. Okay, I retired as an E-8. I was a master sergeant in the Army. And I was in, at the time, I was the pro, provost sergeant which means I was the top non-commissioned officer, not a commissioned officer, and a non-commissioned officer in charge of the military police station on Fort Huachuca in Arizona. So I had all the MPs when they were working law enforcement fell under me. I had a person who was a desk sergeant. I think everyone knows what a desk sergeant is. An MP station is essentially the same as a civilian police station. So this uh, sergeant, he was an E5, uh, he worked for me and he had been a desk sergeant for a long time. So what a desk sergeant does is sits at the primary desk inside the desk, inside the MP station and people come in the door to talk to him and then he sends information out to the MPs what they need to do he answers the phone somebody needs an MP to come to their home or there was a car accident or what have you that person he or she will send an MP patrol unit over there okay so he handles all that and a lot of paperwork busy guy with a lot of responsibility well this fella had been a desk sergeant for long enough that he was getting pathetically depressed and he got into drinking heavily. Well, one day when he was off duty, he came onto the military installation, Fort Huachuca, what I call a post, an army post. And he, well, he had his own, we call it a POW, instead of prisoner of war, a privately owned weapon. It was a nine millimeter Beretta is what he was carrying. It was his own. So he went to the MP station and went inside to talk to the desk sergeant who was on duty at that time. I believe this was a Sunday. And the desk sergeant said that uh, the guy was asking, acting kind of strange and he knew he had his gun with him. He was in civilian clothes. He wasn't on duty. And he had told him that he was going to go some someplace out of the way on, on this uh, Fort Huachuca, which has a whole lot of wooded areas. And uh, he had the feeling that this guy was going to harm himself. So what he did was he called up myself and the provost marshal, which is an officer. This man was a, uh, an 05 I'm sorry, in 04, he was a major at the time. But he was like the policy maker, the, the big man for the PMO. Uh, that, and PMO is, of course, the uh, Provost Marshal Office. So I worked under that major. Anyhow, we got together and all the other MPs that were on duty, and we went out to where this guy was last seen by a couple of our MPs who were on patrol. And those MPs said that when they saw him, that they were going to approach him and he showed his gun to them in a manner that made them feel threatened and he wanted them to go away. And he was by himself and he was going to go off into the, the woods, not driving. So they thought he was going to harm himself. And that combined with what the death sergeant had seen got us all out there. So there we are out in this gravel road not right where all the people on the installation lived, but away from them. 
right out in kind of the countryside but still on the post so lo and behold we see this guy walking down the road and i told the provost marshal that uh you know we're kind of kicking it around what do we do what do we do so i told him i said well i he works for me we get along well how about if i just walk up and talk to him so he agreed so we had all these MPs on duty armed uh, back there with the provost marshal. And they were walking at a distance behind me in a group like. Just kind of trying to keep me into eye shot of this. And I walked up to the sergeant and he told me to get away from him. Leave him alone. So then I just started kind of just talking to him. Uh, you know, what's going on? We heard this, we saw that. And are, you, are you upset about something? You know, just not really deep questions. He got, he wanted me to go away. So what he decided he was going to do was take his gun and point it to his head. He says, you get away from me or I'm going to pull the trigger, right? So I thought, well, I can't really go away because then he might pull the trigger. If I stick around, he might pull the trigger. Either way, it's kind of a no-win situation for me. So he started a little countdown. And by the time he'd get to one, he was going to pull the trigger. And what I did was, since we were walking on a gravel road, and it was you know kind of uneven, a little clumsy walking on something like that, what I did was I, I stumbled once, but just like one time out of step and then, you know, caught myself and walked along like nothing had happened while he was uh, playing around with his gun. So I did that to make him think that if I make a quick move, it's because my footing is bad. And we're continuing to walk. The other MPs behind us. So I thought, OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the gun. So with my he was on this side of me. So with this arm, I reached up and he was right, right, you know, beside me, almost shoulder to shoulder. And I, I grabbed the gun and then real quick, I was going to wrestle it out of his hand. Well, he wasn't a big guy and I was probably 47 at the time. I suppose he was like 37, but he was pretty strong and he won the wrestling match. So as he pulled the gun down, he fired it. And when he fired it, it shot me right through here and came out back here. Okay, and that felt like a, an enormous hot blast of air went through me. But I was still functioning okay. Now, this is all happening in seconds, of course. Then, as we continued to struggle, the gun got pushed down further. Because I was trying to push it down. But he had his hand on the grip and the trigger. And he pulled it again when it was right next to my like my knee, right? And he shot a hole in my left knee. It went in here. I mean, the exact knee, the joint, and it came out over here. And it just blew everything in that knee out. When that happened, I just fell forward because I, I didn't have that leg to stand on. And it happened suddenly, so I wasn't prepared for it. And I landed, boom, in the gravel on my elbows like this, but in a prone position, straight out. Okay, so there I was. Then I hear him is, is, you know, moving around on the gravel. And so he shot me twice. At that point, the MPs behind me had uh, prepared to shoot him. What he did next was he got another round in the chamber, right? And that round in the chamber did not go in correctly. It kind of tipped and was caught. He couldn't fire the gun. So the people in the back, they don't know if he had tried to chamber the round and shoot me a third time because the gun was on me. And when he couldn't shoot it a third time, he decided to turn around and point it at them. Whether he was going to shoot them or not, they didn't know. All they knew was what had already happened. So it looked to, me, to them like he, he was going to shoot me a third time, but then decided to shoot them. What they did was they dropped down to a knee and he got shot 
in the chest three times, one of which went through his heart and he died probably 30 or 45 minutes later. So when I heard the shots fired, I'm, I'm on the ground, I'm conscious and everything, but uh, I, all I heard was him go, Ugh, like that. And I, I, never even, I couldn't even see if he'd fallen down or not. So anyway, of course, everybody runs up and they're trying to give me first aid and they're calling an ambulance to come and they get me into an ambulance, they get him into an ambulance, we go to the hospital and in the emergency room, I'm laying on a gurney and there's a curtain and he's on the other side of the curtain on another gurney. And then my first sergeant, he came around the curtain and told me, he says, I want you to know, I'm not gonna say the man's name, but Sergeant so-and-so just died. So that was that. And I ended up uh, getting my knee, uh, a lot of surgery done on my knee, very serious surgery. Uh, it's still kind of messed up today, but it's worked much better than they thought it would work. Uh, I ended up getting a, the biggest award the Army had for an act of heroism outside of a combat zone. So if I was in a combat zone, the highest thing you can get is like a Medal of Honor. But I mean, inside a combat zone, outside of a combat zone, like where I was, there was no war going on. Um, the highest is the soldier's medal. So that's what I was given and for that. And of course, a person feels terrible about a thing like that. I mean, it's nice to be recognized, but it'd be far, far better if I could put on a Superman suit and fly around Earth, spin time backwards and do things different so this guy lived through it. But, of course, that can't happen. So, I, I think that's kind of an interesting story to lay out for you. And uh, as far as my knee goes, the doctor told me, this is an interesting thing here. The doctor told me that, this was in 02, that in probably no more than six years, I would have to get an artificial knee put in because this one, what they told me was, they put, they put my joint they rebuilt it with he said think of wood putty but wood putty for bones he said that's what we've done to your knee because the, the the insides were just gone so he said but because of your age and like i said i think it was 47 at the time he said if at all possible you don't want to get an artificial knee now because in 10 to 15 years you have to get another one and then you have to get another one and he said that's a huge horrendous thing to go through, that operation and then the recuperation from it. So they said, wait until you can't stand it anymore, but within six years you'll have to get it because you won't be able to stand the discomfort, the pain. So what I did was, of course I was in the hospital for I think it was 12 days and from there I went home and uh, recuperated there for I think it was like six, six to eight weeks, something like that, before I went back to work and of course I was on a walker and I was on a cane and prior to that a wheelchair. But anyway, you get through all that. Now, um, what I had done while I was recuperating at home was I heard about something that you could go to uh, a person who does healing. So I went on the internet, I found how many of them were around and I did that. I contacted, I don't remember how many of them. There were like 70 qualified people. They had a list of names that I finally came across. I sent an email to all of them. And a lot of them wrote back. And one of, one of them had said, hey, I already sent you healing power. Did you feel anything? No, I didn't. What they said you had to do, and I, I found a person who wasn't terribly far from where I was in uh, Arizona, uh, Sonona. Arizona, which is kind of a famous place for being a kind of a woo-woo setup, right? So they said for $333, you come with cash and you give them an even sum of money, not $335 and they give you $2 change, but exactly $333. And uh, so I went to this woman's place, spent the night in some little uh, like second house they had. And then the next day, she 
came and did this healing work on me. And I like to believe in this sort of thing, but you know, I keep an open mind to it, but I'm not so open that my brain will fall out. Worst thing it could do is cost me $333 and I could get over that. Well, anyway, what I wanted was for my knee to heal up. I wanted to be good to go, right? So this is 2022. On October 11th, it'll be 20 years since I got shot. My left knee that was shot through and still is basically consists of bone putty. I never did get an artificial knee yet. Gives me far less trouble, almost no trouble, except I've lost a little bit of the flexibility. I can't bend it back as far and I can't straighten it completely straight. Almost though. But I can walk fine on it. My right knee, that gives me a lot of trouble. I've got arthritis in there and uh, cortisone makes a difference and Motrin makes a difference, but uh, boy, that thing has given me more pain uh, than my left knee has after the initial healing up. And I often wonder, hmm, I wonder if that uh, healing power actually is the reason for my knee feeling good. And I'm 66, and I'm in pretty darn good health as it is now. My blood pressure is good, my cholesterol's fine. Uh, I feel okay. I'm a little too fat. But other than that, uh, I'm, I'm doing really well. So I just wonder how much that affected me. Pretty interesting. And that's it for this story. So finish up your coffee. And I look forward to seeing you the next time. Goodbye for now. <laughs>